Shinso would arrive to the payphone, the only one that seemed dimly lit and ringing. A rather primitive form of communication in this day and age, hardly ever used, but yet this one was working perfectly. As he picked up the phone line, holding up the call to his ear, he could hear a distinct voice that, while calm, also unhinged. So, someone's finally picked up another lost soul looking for salvation. So you're the one who's been killing people. The telephone killer? Oh, I'm far more than that. <laughs> but I'll indulge, since it appears you've been the one looking for me. Would you like to meet? It's hardly possible. Even if you tried to track me down, I've had a friend using a special relay, making it quite difficult to pinpoint my location. But since you've ingratiated yourself into my realm, then perhaps you'd like to play a little game. It's called Ring, Ring. You see, right now from where I'm standing, I see a couple of little piggies who want to be cured of the disease called life. Though I imagine that from their perspective, they see things rather differently. If you hurt them, Zass, there's no place for you to hide. I will find you. Oh, I bet you will. Did I ever tell you the story about my first kill? No? As you're probably not aware... My parents, when they died, I was rich. So rich that I could have had anything I wanted. But of course, all I wanted was them back. But I know now that it was impossible, of course. Their deaths served a higher purpose. But back then, I had yet to experience... The joy of cold steel cutting through warm flesh. I had no idea that I could save these people from the relentless misery of their existence. You should have stayed that way. Really? Then I'll stop now. Hurry and find another telephone. Or these little piggies will start to bleed. The phone line would hang up and Shinso, with the assistance of Bruce, would scomb throughout the area of Arkham City, looking for where the closest payphone was ringing next, and it seemed to be all the way across to the other side. The payphones were scattered, something once used no longer in service, and he was obviously cutting them on at random. You better get a move on, Bruce would say. You'll only have a short deal of time. With that, Shinso would use the grappling hook to glide through the air, looking across the landscape of Arkham City. As he switched his detective vision, he was capable of seeing and locating any particular payphone that was in service. Its ringing would give off its echo location from a distance, allowing for him to track it a lot faster. For Shinso, he merely rolled his eyes, even while under the mask. If he could have used his quirk the first time around, it would have made things so much easier. But unfortunately, one of the side effects of his quirk, he couldn't use it over the phone or through any form of speaker or anything like that. 
some form of diluting or making his voice artificial in a way, and thus his quirk couldn't activate. No, he had to be in the same room with the person for his quirk to work, and they had to hear his voice directly, not through some speaker or a phone or anything like that. So for now, he was stuck in a game of cat and mouse. He arrived to the second phone, and with not a moment too soon. You made it. I think I will continue my story. I feel I need to talk, to confess, maybe. I was rich, but alone. But not for long, of course. I, I took to gambling. Or maybe it took to me. If only I could have been good at it, maybe I wouldn't be where I am today. This world, it's, it's filled with such fascinating and extraordinary people I'll never comprehend. The idea of a quirk, and I sadly was born without one. It's weird, you know. For so long, I... I tried to find meaning in my life. So many peers I grew up with wanted to be a hero. I'll, I'll never forget this one girl. Yes, this one girl, she had a quirk. A, a beautiful, beautiful quirk. She had butterfly wings. She was born with them, of course. They were able to grow and shrink at a whim. But when they grew, they became something fascinating, truly mesmerizing. She was a acquaintance, of course. I remember she was my she was my eighth kill, actually. I um I wish she hadn't followed me home that night, but I'm getting sidetracked, of course. <laughs> Anyway, as I, I took to gambling, yes. But as such, my life began to spiral out of control. Sadly enough, I lost everything, but I desperately, I formed a plan to try to win back my parents' money and to be happy again. It didn't work, of course. Plans like that never do. And then I found myself standing outside of the Iceberg Lounge on a hot summer night. I remember feeling something. Hope, maybe. The phone would hang up once again. And for Shinso, it led him on another wild goose chase. Moving from the perimeter wall of Arkham City, going as far back to the museum. Another payphone. And this time, there were a few of Penguin's thugs still rolling around, trying to scrounge what they could now that their boss was held up at a moment. The phone was continuing to ring, but Shinzo knew he wouldn't get any privacy until he took these goons down. There were five of them in total, two of them holding shock batons, one of them holding what appeared to be a riot shield and another one a machete. The fifth one, who wasn't armed at all, was the furthest away. Shinso, being as clever as he was, would descend through the darkness, moving close behind the straggling thug, making sure that the others hadn't seen him yet. It was then that Shinso would lean into his ear and whisper, who goes there? Huh? Who said that? Oh. <laughs> All right, from the top. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to walk behind your two friends over there, the ones with the shock batons. You're going to ask where any more of the weapons are. And once you get with some, you're going to take the both of them out when they're not looking. I'll deal with the one with the shield and the machete. The hypnotized goon would nod as he moved towards his companions, asking if they knew where any more weapons would be held up. 
Uh, check the chest around the corner. You already know. You forget? No, just didn't know we had any left. Whatever. Just pick up whatever you can. Thankfully, there was one more shock baton left. He came walking back as the others were continuing to talk. It was then that he would jab the first one in the back, shocking him unconscious and causing him to fall to the ground. The second one turned to ask what he was doing, and the two of them ended up in what was a good old standoff, and, clumsily enough, the two would end up shocking each other, the hypnotized goon and the one trying to fight in self-defense, causing them both to go down. The one thug holding the machete would quickly be taken out by Shinzo, who turned his sights to the last one with the riot shield. He would flip his cape over him, stunning him just long enough to run up on top of the shield before jumping behind and delivering a back strike, taking him out. After doing so, he would go to answer the phone and receive yet another piece of the puzzle. All while the encryption key was running through the background, trying to pinpoint the relay and figure Zaz's location. The Iceberg Lounge. It was crawling with the disgusting flesh of humanity. And don't be misled. It wasn't just villains and loan sharks and things of that nature. No, even heroes. Those who had vices they needed to let loose. Truly the scum of society. They preach about their morals and their good judgment only to be no different than the rest of us. You could find anything there, especially if you had the money, of course. And in the beginning, I seemed to be winning. All the cards went my way, and I found myself even at the owner's table. For some reason, I thought I would win. I thought that they would play fair. I looked around the table, and I saw who I was up against. Card sharks, thugs, wannabe criminals, and gangsters. And then there was that disgusting midget who ran the place. And one by one, they all lost or folded their chips and they started piling up till soon it was just me and him. Of course, though, back then he wasn't called the penguin, of course, that accident with the eye hadn't happened yet. And the way things were looking, it came down to just me and him. I folded and looked at my cards. Six of clubs, six of diamonds. He looked scared. But then he leaned forward. And I could smell the cigar stench on his breath. A six of spades. And then a six of hearts. I felt, I felt good. He belched out some smoke as he started laying his cards down on the table. And card by card, my heart sank. A three, a four, a five, a six, a damn seven! <sighs> his straight flush ended me there. And I was lost. Thrown out into the city to die. Penniless. The call would stall once again, and now it was left to Shinso to once again try and find yet another phone. Hey, Bruce, have you got anything yet? Have you pinpointed his location down at all? Bruce had his hands full, dealing with multiple heroes out in the field, trying to relay them all the information he could from the Batcave. I've only been able to relay about 60%. You're going to need to pick up a few more calls if I'm going to be able to pinpoint his exact location. <sighs> It'd be a lot easier if I could have used my quirk through the damn phone. 
I thought Tim was supposed to be working on a way to make that a lot more feasible for me. It can't be helped. Every quirk has its natural weakness, and this is one that you've come into. It's no point in complaining. You simply have to deal with the cards you've been dealt and make the best of them. That's your only chance. Yeah, I guess you're right. Before long, another phone would ring. This time, moving him back towards the old GCPD building. Of course, he knew that Midoriya was going to be heading in that direction sooner or later. Perhaps he'd tag along with him if he got the chance. As he arrived, he would pick up the phone once again, only to be regaled by more talking from Zaz. Can you imagine what it was like for me? I was numb. I'd lost everything and I was alone, crying like a baby staggering through the streets. And I found the answer. I found what I had been looking for. There was a bridge. A bridge that looked into the deep blue sea in the cover of night. A void of darkness. I felt, I felt if I had just, if I could have just jumped into it, then perhaps, perhaps all my problems would go away. I'd finally be able to let go. At least that's what I wanted. And do you want to know what happened next? You want to know? Some bastard approach. He had a quirk, of course, but he didn't damn well know how to use it. Just some pyrokinetic looking for a cheap thrill. I swear. Fire users. They get this strange sense of power, all because they can spark a few flames from their fingertips. And that's all this one could do anyway. He wasn't like Endeavor, couldn't just create flames. No, he could only create little fireballs from his fingertips. No bigger than a damn golf ball. And yet, and yet, <laughs> and yet this pathetic bastard who hadn't worked for anything, who didn't have a yen to his name, he held me up and demanded my money. My money! Can you believe it? I looked into his cold, desperate eyes. And I saw something familiar. I saw oblivion. I saw that we were all the same. Stuck on a miserable loop that demands salvation. In that moment, I knew. One of us was not going to make it off of that bridge alive. One of us was going to demand salvation. And I gave it to him. Shinzo would check with Bruce once again. Asking how much of the relay had been completed. It was just over 85 to around 90%. One more call should do the trick. Although honestly Shinzo was tired of hearing about... Victor and his sob story. What was it about him anyway? Shinso asked. What made him the way that he was? It's hard to answer. There's no any direct answer that can even be given for a question like that. What makes Victor the way that he is? But what makes any man the way that they are? A lot of times people say that one bad day is all it takes. That in one day you can lose everything. Lose sight of who you are, who you used to be. Lose sight of your morals. Everything that made you who you were. All of it can be taken away. No man is above falling from grace, Shinzo. 
That's a lesson you come to learn in this field. No matter how twisted, no matter how morbid, everyone at one point or another in their life saw themselves as the hero in their own story. They saw themselves as the good guy in all of it. And maybe sometimes they still do. And sometimes, sometimes they give in to the darkness and they choose to embrace the role of the villain. A quirk or not, it doesn't change the facts of life. When we're each born into this world, we have autonomy over ourselves to decide what type of life we will lead, what type of people we'll be. Ultimately, though, no one can walk that path for you. Zaz has chosen to become a killer, and it is our job to bring him to justice. At that moment, another phone was located. Shinso would quickly dash, moving towards the steel mill of all places. He knew he had to be careful, especially given who was running the area. As he answered the final call, Zaz was at the crescendo of his story. Can you imagine the vagrant surprise when I pulled out my pocket knife and I fought him? I fought him! It was such a rush, such a thrill. I bet he'd never been stood up to before like that, especially by someone without a quirk. Oh, he put up a good fight. He singed my hair. So much so, I had to shave it all off. I still have some of the burn marks that he gave me. I consider those to be a special badge of honor. A reminder of my first tussle, my first fight. It was as if in that moment we were both dancing we shared in the dance of life and death, walking through the valleys and the shadows. He hurt me. He burned me. He scarred me. But in the end, when it's all said and done, he was the one at peace. I watched his lifeless body fall to the ground as I plunged my blade straight through his throat and I hacked off his head. It all happened in a blur. It was so fast. The blood sprayed all over my face and I felt it. I saw the life as it left his eyes. When it was over, I felt lost, like it was meaningless. I had made a sacrifice, you know. I'm a hero. I'm a hero, just like him. You know, all might, he provides justice. And so do I. It doesn't matter to me what you are. Man or woman. Child. Hero or villain. To me, everyone is equal. I will shoulder the burden of life. That is my calling. That is why I was born. After it was over, I took my blade and I buried it into my forearm and I gave myself the mark. At that point, I realized why I was created. I am the champion of death. I am the angel of death. It is through me that I grant salvation. I wage my war 
a war against life. Life is the enemy and death, death is the one true hero. That's why I live. I will continue to fight against life. I am the soldier of death. And because of that, I will shoulder that burden, that responsibility. But I won't forget. I'll never forget. That's why. That's why I bear the marks to remind myself of why I fight this crusade. And I have a place. I have a place just for you. A place special because you chose to listen to me. Because you have chosen to understand my... Midway through the call, Shinzo would cut it off. Having gotten an exact location of where Victor Zass was hiding out. And surprisingly enough, his lair, his base of operations, was one of the old miniature factories within the lot of the Sionis steel mill. Are you kidding me? Shinzo would say with a hint of disgust. He was here this whole time? I had to listen to his damn speech all night, and he was just focused, Shinzo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, though, how the hell has he been able to just waltz around here without any resistance? What? The Joker a fan of his or something? Fan? Not likely. But they probably do appreciate each other's works. All the same... Shinzo would head towards the lot in question, walking into one of the miniature factories. And sure enough, Victor Zaz was there with a couple of the political prisoners. He had some device that he was activating for the phones all throughout Arkham City. He kept going on and on about what he was going to do. From what I've been told, This particular being is clad in black and he wears a mask with a red X. Perhaps he too shares in my ideals for he too bears a mark. A mark. His X. I will mark his X on the very flesh of my heart. Shinzo was silently moved throughout the factory making sure he wasn't seen or heard. Thankfully, the factory was one of the cooling plants of the steel mill, the rushing waves of the running water able to mask the sounds of his boots clacking against the metal floors, hiding behind the walls and keeping himself out of sight of Zaz. The few people that he was holding hostage, fearing for their lives, as he finally reached to the shallow wall that Zaz stood with his back turned, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. He would break through the wall effortlessly with a single punch, grabbing hold of Zaz from the neck and pulling him forward. Even while caught off guard, Zaz was prepared for this, as he took his blade and tried to lunge towards Shinso cutting away at his arm and giving him a gash across his left forearm. As he turned to him, a sinister grin etched across his face. You sneaky bastard! You've managed to track me down! (laughs) Well, no matter. You and I, we're bound together, one and the same... Yes, this is how it's meant to be. You and I, you and I will dance the dance of death. And I will give you the taste of darkness. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yes, it's right indeed. They fall for it every time. Uh. 
uh, here's what you're going to do. First, you're going to walk into that cage. You're going to lock yourself there. And you're going to stay there. And you're never going to kill anyone ever again. I'll never kill. 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 While Zaz locked himself in the cage, Shinso would move the prisoners and the hostages to safety. You all right? Your arm, it's... I'll be fine. Are you all okay? Yeah. He kept going on and on about how he was going to kill us. He was. What did you do to him? One of the hostages would ask. All you did was say a few words, and now he's not even trying to fight back. Is that a part of your quirk? Who are you? You can call me the Red X. And as for all of you, I'd suggest getting somewhere secure and staying out of sight. He might be taken care of, but you're still not safe here. Wait, are you going to get us out? My friends and I are working on it. All you'll need to do is hold off and wait until a large boom could be heard. Shinso didn't know what that was, but it felt like someone had set off a large bomb. At first, he thought of the worst case scenario. Had Bakugo gotten into something way over his head and now he was about to just nuke everything in its path? However... As Shinso opened the door, off in the distance, he saw a fleet of helicopters. But they weren't any ordinary helicopters. They were military-grade choppers. And they were raining down missiles. He quickly told everyone to get back and to get to the most secure part of the building to bunker down and hold on for dear life. Because little did they know, Protocol 10 had been activated. This concludes My Hero Academia The Dark Knight Returns. What If Deku Was Batman? Season 3 OVA 1 the Tales of Arkham City, The Telephone Killer. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. And stay tuned tomorrow as we'll continue with more Tales of Arkham City. In What If Deku Was Batman, The Dark Knight Returns, Season 3, OVA of Arkham City Arc. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings, signing off, and I'll see you next time.
Protocol 10 will commence in two hours.